Well, thanks, Pastor Jennifer. It's a lovely welcome to us both. Thank you. Well, let me have a little look at you. Good. You're looking good. On behalf of Judy and myself, I uh, just want to thank you for the opportunity of spending time here at the fellowship. It wasn't that many months ago, I think, that I sat at the back with uh, Dr. Peter Van Breeder and uh, enjoyed your fellowship there, but never thought that the next time I came I'd be standing here looking at you. And uh, it's a privilege to be able to do that. Um, I'm looking forward to today. I feel that it is a huge privilege, if not a little precocious, that I should come and talk to you about the Spirit. He's God. Uh, he's fundamentally inexplicable, but He has invited us to explore Him. And then He has said, I'd like to help you to explore me. And as well as that, He helps us to explore Jesus, and He helps us to explore the Father. And this privilege of exploring the God that we worship makes Christianity somewhat unique because certainly in, in the ancient world, the religions of the day, the gods, the deities, weren't overly keen that people should get to know them. Fundamentally, the gods weren't that interested in people. And that's why Jesus, when he introduced the Father to us and the Spirit to us, introduced us to a brand new God who was prepared not just for us to get to know him or get to know about him, but to have a personal relationship with him and to be able to be touched by us and to encounter us and to for us to experience him. This is quite remarkable. And so for us to spend a few hours today doing that, I want to acknowledge to him how grateful we all are that we can do that together. Now, Pastor Jennifer mentioned that I have a couple of degrees, but my role is not to intimidate, but it is to make you think, not to destabilize you, but to give you the opportunity to explore and to discover. And I anticipate that in this journey we experience today, I also will discover, because this is not just me talking to you, the Spirit is superimposing himself on what I will say and I anticipate that as we are in this process of hearing me don't lose sight of the fact that he wants to speak to us as well this is not a monologue this is intended to be a trialogue which is even better than a dialogue I don't suppose right now you're going to talk back to me but I would like to encourage you to do that the more that the day goes on but over and above that the Spirit anticipates that he would want to say something. So don't think that this is a time when the Spirit goes and has a cup of coffee. He's done worship with us and he'll turn up later for ministry. But in the meantime, he's now gone for a cup of coffee because now this is preach time. Well, there will be times when he will say something that will be very meaningful to you and uh, will be more significant than that which I say. Don't lose sight of the possibility of that happening to you. So now, what have we got to do today? Well, we've got a little while, and uh, we're going to ask the question, who is the Holy Spirit? Now, I have to confess that although I've been brought up in a Pentecostal church setting in the UK, and still am in a Pente Pentecostal church setting, for the first part of my Christian life, I wasn't overly aware of who the Holy Spirit was. That's not to say that I didn't believe in him, because I did. In fact, after learning John 3.16, the next verse that I learned was Acts 1.8, which talks about the power of the Spirit that comes upon the life of a believer. But if I was then asked, well, now tell me about the Spirit, I would probably say, well, he is in my life to tell me off when I do things wrong, and he is there to give me some gifts from time to time. Anything more than that? No, I don't think so. He's there to discipline me, and he's there to gift me. What I never realized was that he was there to be my friend and to be my best friend. He was somewhat viewed as somebody who lived in the shadows, if not the desert. And from time to time, he would turn up and then he would be gone. But it was Jesus who was the one who walked with me and the Father who was present with me. But the Spirit, well, he was somewhere over there. And then, years later, I began to explore what the New Testament had to say about the Spirit. And I found that he was so much more imminently involved in the lives of Christians, including myself, than I had ever dared imagine. And the tragedy was because I didn't realize he was there, I wasn't looking out for the possibility that he might speak to me as often as he wanted. Because I wasn't listening, then I wasn't able to hear him. And if I had been able to hear him, I would have been shocked 
by what he would have had to say to me. Because although he does discipline us, and although he does give us gifts, they are by no means the top of his agenda as to what he wants to do in our lives. Fundamentally, the role of the Spirit in our lives is to do us good. Fundamentally, the role of the Spirit in our lives is to be on our side. He's on our side. And I hope that throughout this day, by the time you finish our time together, you will walk with a spring in your step, realizing that somebody is dedicated to be on your side. And of course, that doesn't mean that Jesus isn't on your side or that the Father isn't on your side, because wherever the Spirit is, there is Jesus. And wherever the Spirit is, there is the Father. And if the Spirit is in you, and he is because he promises to come in at salvation, then Jesus is there and the Father is there. And now we're moving into areas that my mind can't cope with, which is all to do with the Trinity. There was a time when it was much easier for me. Jesus lived in heaven, the Father was everywhere, and the Spirit was somewhere I didn't know. But now I'm having to cope with the possibility that the Spirit is in me, and Jesus is in me, and the Father is in me, and so also is he in my guitarist friend here, and so also he is in heaven, and he's over there as well. I don't attempt to understand the Trinity. If I could understand God, I would choose another religion. Why should I understand the one who's created me? But I enjoy exploring him, and I enjoy the fact that he wants us to explore what a remarkable God he is. We, today, have only the opportunity to explore the Spirit, which is what we're going to do. Now, if you think that was a long introduction, it probably was. So, and anyway, it wasn't overly an introduction, it was making some statements. Um, let me tell you why I want us to do what we're doing. And I speak to those of you, I suspect, who have a charismatic or a Pentecostal experience. You're aware of the role of the Spirit in, in your lives. Um, uh, likewise, myself. But as I've already hinted at, I, I, for much of my Christian experience, I misunderstood who the Spirit was. And I fear that many in the Pentecostal world and in the charismatic Christian world still misunderstand who the Spirit is. For example, certainly amongst Pentecostals, we have tended to value the Holy Spirit as somebody who gives gifts, which he does. But we have thought of him as the great gift giver. And partly, we have sought to explore him and to have a relationship with him for the benefit of receiving a gift from him. And that can be quite unhelpful, because it means that we see him as something of a utilitarian member of the Godhead who is there to give us a gift, when in reality, he is there to experience a relationship with us. And I would not want to devalue him. And that's another problem that we sometimes have with the Holy Spirit. We know that there are three members of the Trinity, the Father, the Son, and the Spirit. But even as we say it, the Spirit's always third. Now, I know he's third, but there's only three in the list. And that seems to devalue him as well. And worse than that, we tend to view the Spirit, or the Godhead, like this. There's the Father, and there's the Son, and then there's the Spirit. We view them somewhat hierarchically. The Spirit comes into this world because Jesus sends him. Or later in the New Testament, the Father sends him. It sounds as if he's kind of a divine servant. Worse, a divine slave. He only functions when the Father and Jesus have a job to do, and they don't want to do it, so who's going to do it? Oh, Spirit, will you do it, please? <laughs> Somebody needs to live in the Christians. I'm not going to do it, says Jesus. I did 33 years. Father says, well, I'm never coming down. Spirit, it's your job. You're going to have to live in Pastor. René. Okay, well, I'll do that. That's the spirit. He's gracious. And, and these subtle statements that I'm obviously offering you in jest can lead us to assume that somehow the spirit is a little less significant than the Father, a little less significant than Jesus. So I'm sure that in your own mind you don't think like that, but the tendency if we do is that we are not aware of how much remarkable benefit he has to offer us because he is as much God as Father is, as Jesus is. It's Father, Son, Spirit. They are each of them intrinsically equal and divine, although different. Why else do we misunderstand the Spirit? Well, I don't know about you, but for much of my life, I wasn't too sure whether we should pray to the Spirit. Obviously, we pray to the Father. Jesus prays to the Father. 
And obviously we pray to Jesus because he encourages us to do that. But should we pray to the Spirit? Well, maybe we could if he was God, but is he God? We went through a phase back home in my home country, which is Wales, which is next to England, when we used to sing a song, which I don't know if you know it, it went something like this. Father, we love you, we worship and adore you. Do you know that one? Yes. Okay. It's in a, hard to sing the third verse. You've you seen my notes. <laughs> exactly. Father, yes, he's worthy of our worship, he's worthy of our praise and our love. Jesus, we worship, we... Yep, that's fine. Spirit. And when we got to we worship, we weren't quite too sure whether we should. Is he ranked as high as the Father, as high as Jesus? Surely it's Father, Son, Spirit. Well, of course, he is worthy of our worship because he is God. But these subtle statements seem sometimes to indicate that he isn't as significant as he truly is. If you look for the Spirit in the Old Testament, you don't really find him. The term the Spirit of God is only used three times in the Old Testament and there it's clearly referring to God the Father because in the Old Testament there is no Trinity. It's the Father or God that the Jewish people worship. So that given the two-thirds of our Bible doesn't say much about the Spirit as a separate entity still lends weight to this myth that he clearly isn't as important as he might think he is. The fact of the matter is, he is remarkably important. He doesn't even have a name. Father, we call him God, or we call him Lord God, or maybe Creator. Jesus, you will call him Savior, or you'll call him Jesus, or Christ. Spirit, well, the Greek word is pneuma. It means breeze, wind. It's not a brilliant name, dear wind. We thank you for your presence with us today. Um, I don't know what name you give to the Spirit in your own thinking. It's too early in our relationship for me to ask you because you'll be reticent to respond. But you might just want to think in your minds, what word would I give the Spirit if I was to communicate with him or, or talk to him? Alternatively to Spirit. I'll tell you the word I give. And it's a word that I've used over these past number of years, and it's the word friend. It's not to say that Jesus isn't, or that the Father isn't, but increasingly I have been aware of the nature of the Spirit as my friend, and it is largely to do with why he has chosen to come and live in our lives. I say that quite deliberately, why he has chosen to come in our lives, because although Jesus sends the Spirit and the Father sends the Spirit, it doesn't mean that he comes without a sense of his own determination to come and live in our lives. His is a privileged role to function within us. That would be his perspective, not mine. I don't see that it's a privilege for him to come and live in me, but he sees it as a privilege to come and live in me because in that regard, he brings the Godhead into our lives and begins to give us the opportunity to encounter Jesus and the Father and himself, the Spirit, by being in us. And in that regard, he is a remarkable friend. A friend who will not leave us. Oh, I know the Father says in Hebrews, I'll never leave you. And Jesus will never leave us. But neither will the Spirit leave us. And given that he has come to be so close to us, the promise that he will never leave us, even though we sin, is quite a remarkable statement on his behalf. We're going to touch this later, but I hint at it now. Do you remember when Paul encourages the Christians in Ephesus and he says, don't grieve the Spirit. Don't grieve him. Don't make him sad. Don't disappoint him. Don't hurt him. You might be expecting Paul to say, because in time he will leave you. He never says that. I think if I was the Spirit, I would leave me from time to time because of the way I let him down. But the Spirit won't do that. And it's not because he enjoys pain. It is because he is committed to us. And that's why Paul says, don't hurt him because you are hurting the one who has sealed you. You have hurt the one who is your best friend. So with, with some of my baggage and with some of our misunderstandings, we sometimes can struggle to understand the significance of who he is in our relationship and in his relationship with us. Let's never forget that although he has no body, although he doesn't have eyes, although he doesn't have ears, literally, 
He does have the capacity to see us. He has the capacity to hear us. He has the capacity to be so close to us that there isn't a gap between us and him. And in that regard, we are exploring somebody who has already determinedly decided to stick with us. Now, the New Testament writers realized that they had a problem when they sought to explore the spirit. He's fundamentally inexplicable. You can't get to the bottom of him. Of him. He's like the universe. And so they decide to use metaphors to help them in the quest because they do not want the, the readers, the Christians in the first century, to lose sight of the fact that the spirit is there to be explored, but they know that their own intellects are finite and the intellects of the readers are finite, so they know that it is an endless quest that will never be completed, but they at least want to start the journey. Actually, I don't know what you think about heaven, but I wonder whether the reason why God has created eternity with us in mind is so that we can get to know him continually. Now, if there's a Bible college in heaven, I will sign up and I will thoroughly enjoy being a student and have Peter and Stephen and Paul and David come in to talk to me and Jesus to come and give guest lectures. But for some of you, you might think, oh dear me, if there's a Bible college in heaven, please can I go somewhere else? <laughs> and I don't know whether you think that when you get to heaven that you'll know everything, um, and that may be the case, but I like to think that I won't know everything. And I wonder whether it will be possible for me to know everything about God since he's infinite and it will be a constant journey of discovery. Well, the writers of the New Testament, it appears to me, wanted the readers to begin the journey as soon as they became Christians. They knew it was a forlorn task because God is fundamentally unknowable because he is so remarkably great. And so they give little pictures, little metaphors, and they are intended to help us in the journey. So when you think about the spirit, and here you can help me, think about some of the images that are given of the spirit in the New Testament. Can you think of any pictures or uh, symbols of the Spirit that are used in the New Testament? Fire. Fire. Good. Yeah, dove. dove. Good. Wind. 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 Yeah, excellent. Water. You got the idea. And these are not randomly chosen symbols. They are quite carefully chosen by the writers of the New Testament because they are wanting to explore the Spirit as far as we're concerned in our day to day, they want to explore the spirit and so they choose metaphors which will give us a little picture of the spirit in this regard and together when they are put together they give a bigger picture of who he is and I'd like in our time together this morning to explore some of the symbols of the spirit and they will give us different descriptions of who he is. They won't be comprehensive, they were never intended to be, but they are specific pictures that were intended to be of value to the readers of the New Testament. And I think I'm going to use one that I don't know whether anybody said actually. Did somebody say oil? Oh, here's your chance of saying you did, whether you didn't or not. See, it's not good enough, Pastor <laughs> René. I'm sorry about that, but you know. Next time, don't let me down. <laughs> but I could spend time talking about all of them, um, but we just don't have time. So I'm going to choose oil first of all, because certainly as Pentecostals, we associate oil with the Spirit quite a bit. And I wonder why. What is the significance of oil as a symbol of the Spirit to the first century readers. Um, before I even explore this, maybe we should just remind ourselves of what it was like to be a first century Christian. You were being told by Paul, by Matthew, by the other writers of the New Testament, by Luke, about the Spirit. Now, if you are coming from a non-Christian perspective, you are very aware of spirits, deities, diamonds, you know them. And although there are countless ranks of gods and goddesses with differences, there is a fundamental similarity between all of them. And that is, they are not interested in you. 
I'm sorry about that, but they're not interested in me either. Because the gods have no real interest in people. In fact, there is a word, a Greek word, that is used of the people's perspective of the gods. And you'll understand the English word when I give you the Greek word. The Greek word is apatheo. In other words, the gods are apathetic to people. They're not interested in you. And why should they be? You are just ordinary, weak, fragile, vulnerable, created beings, and they are none of those. They are gods, and they live in the heavenlies. So there's my first problem. They don't care what happens to you. Secondly, in the ancient world, the assumption is that if anything goes wrong in life, the gods have achieved that. So if you are ill, if you've had a nightmare, if you've lost your car keys or something equivalent in the first century, the assumption is that the gods have done that. Why have they done that? It is because you have offended them. So the role of the people in the first century is to do something to placate the gods. You do not expect to have a relationship with the gods unless you are somebody as significant as the emperor or a military general or perhaps some of the priests in the higher echelons of the priestly services to these gods or goddesses. But for the majority of the people, you don't expect to have a relationship with them. In fact, your life is lived in fearful civility. Your role is to, on your way to the office every morning, is to have a couple of gifts in your pocket and you will give a gift to this temple, to that temple, to that temple, until you run out of gifts. But at least you have placated those gods, those goddesses. So it means your life will be a little easier than it would have been if you hadn't have placated them. Now that is the fundamental perspective that people have of the gods. It's best to keep out of their way. Because if you do get in focus, they're unlikely to give you anything that's positive. The writers of the New Testament introduce the readers to a spirit and they need to help the people realize that he's different to them now let's imagine that you were a jew living in the first century you have a very different picture of jehovah you know that he cares for you you have a history of his care for you as a jewish people but in the first century that history is wearing a little thin because your god jehovah has not spoken to you for at least 400 years since the days of Malachi and the earlier prophets. And the assumption on the part of the Jews is either God doesn't love us anymore, or worse, the Greco Roman gods have become more powerful than our local Jewish God, Jehovah. And they have subjugated him. Either way, they find themselves in a fragile position where the Spirit of God himself has largely gone. The writers of the New Testament are introducing the Christians to the Spirit. They're also introducing them to Jesus. They're also introducing them to the Father. But the concept of the Spirit, how are these young Christians going to feel about him? I wonder whether you've realized why the New Testament writers speak about the Spirit as the Holy Spirit. We don't speak about the Holy Jesus. We don't really speak about the Holy Father, but we do refer to the Spirit as the Holy Spirit. And I suspect that most of you will think, as I would have, well, this is a reference to the fact that he is sinless. He's holy. He doesn't make mistakes. He's perfect. He's holy. He's pure. He's holy. Well, of course, he's all of those. But that is not the fundamental reason why the descriptive word holy prefaces the word spirit. Here's the reason. The word holy in Greek is hagios, and hagios fundamentally means different. At the moment, I am holy because I'm facing this way. You are also holy, funnily enough, because you are all facing this way. So you're different to me and I'm different to you. Now, that's a very base use of the meaning of holy. But fundamentally, the term holy means different. You had priestesses and priests who functioned in the ancient temples. They were called holy. Their lifestyles were not holy. Far from it. To have a relationship with some of the gods and some of the goddesses would involve you having a sexual relationship with the priest or the priestess. Their lives were quite immoral, but they were still defined as holy. Why? Because they were set apart to this god, set apart to this uh, goddess. They were different. 
And Paul and Matthew and Luke say, the spirit that I'm introducing to you, he's different to all the other kinds of spirits. Huge range of gods and goddesses available to you in the first century. Too many to choose from. And Paul introduces a new god and says, well, here's another one. He's different. Different? How? Tell you how he's different. He's on your side. That's fundamentally why he's different. He's on your side. He's interested in you. He cares for you. He wants a relationship with you. He wants to encounter you. Now, you and I as Christians, we've got used to this fact. But in the ancient world, this was so shockingly unusual that it would be almost unbelievable. Don't be silly. The God who created the universe, that he wants to have a relationship with me? No, I'm sorry, I don't believe it. I'd believe it if you said that he wanted once in a billion years to think about me for one second. That's more believable, but not to have a relationship with me. And that's why the writers of the New Testament keep reminding us he's different, he's holy, he's unique, he's holy. And so they bring the metaphors together. So I come back to the use of the term oil. Why is oil associated with the Spirit? And um, John, the guy who wrote the Gospel of John, he also wrote 1, 2, 3 John in Revelation. And in 1 John, chapter 2, he refers to the oil of the Spirit. He puts them together. Why does he do that? Well, he's not the only one to do it. And in the Old Testament, you have the seeds of this combination being presented to us. That oil that's poured out of a, a jar is associated with the Holy Spirit. And what is the picture that it's intending to share? For me, in, as a 21st century person, I would think, well, oil is a bit sticky, so that means the spirit must be a bit sticky. That doesn't work. So, or oil is something that's going to help this taste better. Maybe the Holy Spirit's a bit tasty. Is that? Now, that these, are, these are inappropriate definitions. So what would it mean to a first century person? So let's put our ancient Jewish spectacles on and explore how oil is used in the Old Testament. So... Let's imagine, I've mentioned Pastor René in a very negative way so far, so let's uplift him in your presence. Let's imagine that Pastor René is now going to be known as King René. And um, so we have asked uh, somebody to come and make him king, as happened with Saul and David and Solomon in the Old Testament. And in order for them to realize that they were going to be made different to everybody else in Jewish society, a prophet would come and would anoint them, Pastor René in our 21st century context, with oil. And it wouldn't be a little dab on the forehead. It would be poured over their head so that it would run down their hair if they had any and onto their shoulders and, and down to the floor. Rather messy. Why on earth are they seeking to do it? Well, helpfully, Samuel, in 1 Samuel, tells us why this happens. The oil that is poured on the head of this ordinary Jewish person and thereafter makes him a different Jewish person is done so that he and you realize that the Spirit is now participating in his life. When does the Spirit come? The moment he is appointed as king. How do I know that? Well, do you see the oil that I'm pouring on his head, folks? Yes, we do. Now, that's intended for you to realize that the Spirit has come. It happens with King David as well. And the writer, Samuel, he tells us when the oil comes on, it's a sign that the Spirit comes on. In fact, thereafter, the combination of oil and the Spirit is so well known to the Jewish readers that they don't need to say it. They simply say the king was anointed. And the implication is that the people will realize, ah, the king's anointed with oil, that means the Spirit is coming into their life. Why is the Spirit coming into the life of that ordinary Jewish person who then becomes king? It is to remind everybody that he has now been given a vocation. It is now being reminded to help them realize that he has been picked out from all the other members of Jewish society and given a task. And the oil is there to remind them that the Spirit of God himself has chosen to come and indwell himself in that person. In the ancient world, that would have been unbelievable. You may remember that there were occasions when God said to Moses, I'm coming to speak to the people. Now you have to do something. Keep the people away. Keep the people away. Yes, I'm coming to this mountain. It's a holy mountain. Don't let them come near because my sacred being is such that they could get burned up. Now, 
Samuel says the Spirit of God himself is coming to indwell this person and to help you realize that that is a truth oil is going to be poured on that person's head in other words oil indicates that the person who's been anointed is special how many people did that happen to in the ancient world in the Jewish world very few people mainly kings you are not living in the ancient Jewish world and the Spirit comes into your life when you achieve a certain level of holiness no he does not he comes into your life the moment you become a Christian in fact he comes into your life before you realize he's there you don't say please come into my life Holy Spirit because if you did it would be too late he's already taken up residence in fact before you knew him or Jesus or the Father the Spirit was the one who was convicting you and helping you realize even though you were dead in your sins and me also lifeless the spirit was the one who was warming us towards God and then when we become followers of Jesus the spirit comes in our lives and Paul confirms that if the spirit isn't in you call yourself whatever you like but you can't call yourself a Christian now thereafter the spirit will impact himself upon our lives more and more and more and more but he comes into your life at salvation and here's my point why does he come in if we are following the Old Testament picture he comes in to say you are now special <laughs> what do you mean I haven't done anything yet I've only just become a Christian I haven't even had a chance to say sorry for all the sins in my life yeah but I just want to let you know that from the perspective of the Godhead we have made a decision you are special remarkable unbelievable I might even want to suggest that's a little premature you might have come into my life and made that statement in a few years time let me just get my life together again get rid of some of my my baggage that I have brought with me give me an opportunity to get to know the Bible a bit better maybe even to speak in tongues or achieve a certain level of holiness then maybe you can come in fully Spirit says no I'm coming in right from the start because you need to know something much more important about me as a member of the Godhead which is we are committed to you now when I start talking like that I start getting nervous I am from Wales and Welsh people live with a certain amount of guilt it's the way that they keep us on the straight and narrow and um, I, I've got rid of a lot of my guilt but it's still there and I'm saying things now that I'm, I'm feeling within I should be saying no no Keith it's no no that that's too good Christianity is good but it's not that good God's wonderful but he's not that wonderful but he is and it's um, we sang a song maybe you sing it as well um, it's all about you Jesus Do you know the one it's, it's, got, it's, a, it's all about you Jesus and it's true it is all about him but when I think about salvation it seems to be all about me all about you in fact in Ephesians chapter 1 Paul and we're not going there I've just thought about it in Ephesians chapter 1 Paul has a, a statement that begins in verse 3 and it ends in verse 14 and in the original it's just one sentence there's no full stops and thankfully our translators have put them in because otherwise we would die if we tried to read it out loud in one go but the reason it's like it is because Paul is so unbelievably impressed with salvation and the words tumble out of him like a waterfall of adoration and praise to God because of the remarkable nature of our salvation and, and here's just one element of it that the Spirit is committed to us from the moment we become Christians and he comes into our lives and says now you're special you're unique I just want to let you know that and at that point I'm saying no don't tell me too much because I'll take advantage of it and the Spirit says I don't care I'm in you to help you not take advantage of it in a way that's negative but I want to just overflow you with a sense of my love for you my affection for you why do you think Jesus came into this world why do you think eternity has been created it's with you in mind because you are God's inheritance these are statements that if the spirit wasn't backing them up I would be thrashing myself metaphorically for being so precocious and so presumptuous as assuming that God should think so much like that about us but the truth of it he does and that's why salvation is so remarkable oil which is placed on an ordinary Jew and makes that ordinary Jew in a moment somebody unique and special why it's because the spirit has come into their lives 
Let me tell you something else, else about oil that you might already be aware of. Oil in the ancient world was used as a, as a therapy, as, as medicine. Um, in other words, oil did you good. Do you remember in, in the book of James where one of the things that uh, James encourages the elders to do is to anoint them with oil? It doesn't work so well in the 21st century context. We're probably wondering why on earth should we do such a strange thing. But in an ancient Jewish setting, it was very understandable. One of the things about oil was that it was associated with therapy. In other words, oil did you good. In, you remember King Herod, who wasn't a particularly nice king, who tried to kill the little boys under two years of age in order to, to get rid of Jesus as a potential competitor to him on the throne. And uh, towards the end of his life, he was dying, he had multiple diseases, and his physicians decided that one way to help him, you will realize that it was probably to harm him, was that he have a bath of oil, rather warm oil. The assumption was the oil would do you good. It nearly fried him, but he wasn't in there long enough for that to happen. Oil did you good. That was an assumption on the part of the ancient uh, peoples. It was a medicinal agent outside Judaism as well. It was viewed as a, a cure for seasickness, um, for example. Many, many suggestions. Oil is associated with the, with the spirit. And the message to the ancient people is... Oil does you good. Oil makes you special. Oil indicates that somebody is on your side who is good and God. Remarkable. You see, when Jesus left this earth, fear filled the minds of the disciples and their tummies must have churned with fear because he says, I'm leaving you lads. What do you mean? We've only been together for three years. Now I'm leaving, and worse, you're not coming. Ah, but it's okay. I'm looking after somewhere for you to come to later. But you're going to be on your own. At the same time, he gives them a promise and says, but you're going to do greater than I did. How can we do greater than you did when you're not even here? Ah, well, here's the clue. Somebody is going to be with you. He's another comforter. Oh, do you remember what comfort the, the Greek word there is parakletos. Para means alongside. Kletos means somebody who's called. He's a called alongside person. And Jesus could never be as much a called alongside person as the Spirit because Jesus could only be in one place at the same time when he was on this earth. But the Spirit can be in many places at the same time because he's the spirit and Jesus says another comforter one who is like me is coming to take my place and he's going to be on your side why to give me gifts yeah yeah we'll, we'll get to that to tell you off and discipline you and transform you yes he'll do that as well but fundamentally he's on your side to do you good to keep whispering you're special now let me give you uh, I'm, I'm 84, and I still, when I preach, thank you for realizing that I'm not 84. Uh, I think I think I've got five minutes. I'm not too sure. I'm going to take you to Galatians 4. You have 15 minutes. Oh, okay. Well, I'll 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 finish in less, and that'll make you feel good. Come and have a look with me in, in Galatians 4, because I just want to move away from these symbols. We're obviously not going to get further than oil, but maybe this is um, what. God might want us to be thinking about in our own lives. Galatians chapter 4 verse 6, just following on from this theme that the Spirit is in our lives to do us good. <clears throat> I'd like to just unpack this verse together. <clears throat> you may know that the, the, the church in the region of Galatia, which is in the south part of modern Turkey, um, can you see that? Yeah. Was a, a group of churches that was established by Paul when he was leaving Israel to move into Europe. And as a matter of fact, when he was en route, he got ill. And uh, in Galatians, he actually uh, says to the Christians, I'm glad that you didn't spit at me. You won't have this in your texts, but it's there. 
and it's just been translated a little bit different. It's in, in verse 13 of this chapter 4, actually. My text says, you know it was because of a bodily ailment that I preached the gospel to you at first. And then he says, I'm glad you didn't spit at me. In other words, there was something physical wrong with him, and the normal response to that is to spit, generally to ward off the evil that was assumed to have caused whatever was wrong with that person. And Paul says, I'm glad you didn't do that with me, but if you'd have seen me, you would have had a reason to do it. Something must have affected him. We don't know what it was. It may have been malaria that he picked up on the southern coast, which was full of malarial swamps at the time. But whatever it was, he had to slow down his journey as a result of which he preached the gospel here and people came to faith. Interesting that, that God took advantage of his bodily sickness, weakness, in order to give him the opportunity to preach the gospel. Anyway, the churches are established and they have come from very difficult contexts um, of paganism. And he reminds them when he writes this, les this letter to them about why the Spirit came into their lives as well. So here we have it in verse 6 of chapter 4, which you have... Thank you for putting that one up. If we get back to chap chapter 4, verse 6, um, you'll see that it says something along these lines. Because you are sons, God has sent the Spirit of his Son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. Okay, so Paul is reminding the Christians, because you are sons and daughters of God, because you're Christians, because you are members of God's family, God has done something. What has he done? He's sent the Spirit. In other words, you haven't had to invite the Spirit to come in. You haven't had to bribe him to come into your life. God has sent him. Now that's interesting because here, God has sent him. When you read the Gospels, it's Jesus who sends him. Now who is it? Well, I think Paul at this point might be wanting to give me a slap because I am functioning like a 21st century person when I want all my questions answered and I want it to be very orderly and very structured. Paul is a Jew. He is very comfortable to live in mystery and tension. And in a sense, none of them sent the Spirit. He came. But in another sense, they all sent him, the Father, the Spirit, the Son, they were all involved in the sending of the Spirit. Why? Because the message is, we want to participate in your life, and the Spirit is the face of God who is in our experience. But never think that it's only the Spirit who's here, and Jesus is over there, and the Father is over there. Wherever the Spirit is, there is Jesus, there is the Father. They're indivisible, although they are separate individual persons. But God has sent the Spirit. Now, interestingly, um, and this won't come through in the English, in Greek, it's possible to use the past tense in a couple of different ways. So I could say, I was coming to church this morning and use the imperfect tense, continuously coming. I was traveling in the taxi that brought us from the hotel. It was a journey. Or I could say, I came. And in that sense, I'm meaning I was there and now I'm here. It's much more immediate. In the Greek, it's called an aorist tense. It's a, a point in time when something happens. And Paul has deliberately used that verb form here. In other words, he says, God is not sending the Spirit. It's not that he left heaven and soon he's come in. Just wait another couple of minutes or years or centuries. He'll be coming. No, no, no. God has sent him. And when God sends, that means that that which is to be sent has arrived. God has sent him. And who has he sent? Well, do you see the description? He sent the Spirit of his Son. Why has he said that? Why hasn't he said the Holy Spirit on this occasion? Or the Holy Spirit of God, which is what he uses in Ephesians. This time he uses this unique phrase, the Spirit of his Son. Well, I think if you think about it, it's fairly obvious. Paul is trying to say to these Galatian Christians, remember, these are people who come from a whole mix-up of races. They are hodgepodge of peoples who live in the southern part of Turkey. In fact, the statement was that any governor from Rome who goes anywhere to look after people, pray to the gods that you don't get sent to Galatia because they are completely ungovernable. That's the kind of people they are. And... Paul says, you have now come into the family of God. You know who you are. 
And you need to know that the spirit of his son has come into your life. He is not some deficient, second-rate, second-class, ordinary spirit. He is the spirit who is associated with Jesus. The same spirit who chose to walk with Jesus, not to help Jesus because Jesus, poor thing, couldn't handle it. The spirit walks with Jesus because the spirit recognizes that Jesus is a worthy person with whom he will walk. He's never done it before. And he won't do it again until you and I become Christians. And then he chooses to walk with us just like he chose to walk with Jesus. That's remarkable. Why would he choose to walk with us as he walked with Jesus? He knew Jesus. He knew he was God. It was completely right that he should walk with Jesus. Why should he walk with me? I'm still letting him down after being a Christian for 40 years. Why would you make that statement, that unilateral declaration of commitment at the start of my conversion experience? Why would you do it? Because that's who I am. That's who your God is. We have made a statement as to our affection for you. Now begin to at least try to live up to the affection that we have for you by responding to us. But we're going to be affectionate towards you like that. Anyway, it's the spirit of his son who is in our lives, says Paul. Nobody less. The same spirit who walks with Jesus is the one that the Father has sent into our lives. Wow. Oh, I say into our lives. My text says, and this text says, into our hearts. He's come into my heart. Well, I wonder what that means to you. I don't know if you celebrate Valentine's Day here or special anniversaries with loved ones or um, it doesn't have to be with a loved one, with a child or a father or a mother or a sister or a friend and you might declare to them that you love them with all your heart and that's perfectly understandable because we associate the heart as the place of affection or romance I'm putting my hand there the heart is somewhere around there isn't it <laughs> but if I was in the first century and I was wanting to ex express to somebody I love you with all my heart they wouldn't understand what I meant if I was speaking to Judy she is a first century Jewess I'm a first century Jew I say to her I love you with all my heart she won't understand because the heart is not associated with romance and affection and love I would have to say Judy I love you with all my bowels and that's <laughs> just not gonna work so well I love you with my intestines that's because they thought that this here was where your affections were based this was what you got nervous about when you were going to talk to somebody for the first time you had butterflies in your tummy here so you love people with your bowels your intestines wherever they use the word heart they use it for a different reason because the heart in the ancient world was the very center of your being now we might think of our mind as being the center of our being or our brain or our consciousness that which makes decisions in the first century that was your heart and the message that Paul is giving is right folks you become a child of God you're now a son you're now a daughter God has decided to do something even before you thought about asking him he sent who has he sent he sent the spirit who's the spirit the spirit who affectionately walked with Jesus because Jesus was worthy of his presence and where has he sent him to be over there or here or here or in my leg no he's been sent to be in the very center of my being now I don't believe for a minute that the spirit lives in my physical heart there's not much room I guess he can get there he's able to do everything but the picture is he's in the very center of my being he can't get closer to me than he currently is Wow what's he there to do Paul because I'm a Pentecostal I think he's there to give me a gift or he's there so that he can be a spy and he's gonna catch me when I do something wrong Paul says well let me tell you why he's there he's there to help you to say Abba father because you may be nervous to call God father gracious me why should he want to own me as his son as his daughter and it's as if the father says I know what you like I know you're going to be nervous spirit please go down live with them encourage them affirm them help them to realize that when I say I'm committed to them I mean it fully spirit says love it I'm going don't hold me back and when I go into their lives my role will be to affirm within me Paul says the same in Romans 8 the spirit's role in our lives is to confirm that we are not just children of God 
That's remarkable, but it's to confirm to us that we can say to God, you're our father. Abba, just the Aramaic word for father. You are not my Lord, which he is. You are not just my creator, which he is. You are not just my God, which he is. But you are my Father. The Spirit who walks with the Son of the Father comes into our lives and walks with us as sons and daughters and enables us to have the same ability to acclaim that God is our Father as Jesus could acclaim that God was his Father. Unbelievable. Paul, you seem to be elevating us almost to be on the same level of Jesus. Paul says, well, yes, that's pretty much what I'm trying to do. You are co-heirs, joint heirs with Jesus. Doesn't mean to say that you're divine or a member of the Godhead or the fourth member of the Trinity, but it does mean to say that as far as the God is con Godhead is concerned, they are wanting to elevate you up. Now begin to appreciate the significance of who you are as far as God is concerned. When you go into this week and you feel that everybody else maltreats you, marginalizes you, dismisses you, doesn't think you're important, just bear in mind that somebody who happens to have created the universe has already decided his perspective of you and his perspective of me that he is completely entwined in our lives. Of course there are consequences to that. The consequences that we live up to that status, that we begin to believe it and manifest it in our own lives but don't lose sight of the fact that fundamentally the spirit comes into our lives to affirm us not to be kind of a bribe to get us to be better Christians but because that's who he is he is like the oil he wants to do us good he wants to affirm that we're special he wants to affirm that he's on our side we need to pray Father, thank you so much for your commitment.